Uh, hi, everybody. Um, I'm Arman Aksoy. Um, I'm a graduate student working with Chris Sander at Memorial Sloan Kettering Computational Biology Center. Um, and before presenting my work, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to um, explain and present our recent work. Um, and then in the next 15 minutes, I'll be basically talking about this project that we call Stadius, a project that's named under the, uh, after the, the Roman poet who first um, who first described uh, the Achilles story. So as the name goes, uh, as, you can, as you can understand, I'll be talking about, uh, in, in this, in this, for this project, I'll be talking about individualized therapeutic vulnerabilities in cancer, so-called uh, Achilles heels, uh, and then how we predict them from the, from the uh, genomic profiles. But before, before, uh, in order to give me give you uh, an understanding of what we call a vulnerability in the in the context of this project, I first have to give you a little bit of background of information about the biological processes, and then here in this uh, in this figure in this really simple cartoon, I'm showing you a normal cell. Again, this is really oversimplified, and then you can see that within the cell uh, there's a metabolic reaction uh, happening. Uh, the, the reaction is represented by this rectangular box. And then as you can see, there are inputs and outputs to this reaction. And uh, these, these types of reactions happen all of the time. Uh, but, but cells are smart, and they want to regulate these type of reactions. So within cells, we have these biological enzymes that, that regulate these, these type of reactions. And again, cells are smart. They don't rely on only a single copy of the enzyme, but they usually have multiple enzymes that catalyze the reaction. So in this case, we have two uh, enzymes. You can have two or, or sometimes more, more than two. And then these type of enzymes are called isoenzymes uh, in, in the biology context. So of course this is what happens inside a normal cell, but we are in interested in what happens in a cancer cell. And then uh, on its way uh, for, a, for a normal cell to become a cancer cell, there are lots of things happening, of course. And then uh, there are many factors affecting this, 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 uh, this process. But the one that we are particularly interested in uh, are the homozygous deletions that happen due to genomic instability of these cancer cells. And as you can see, I'm right now I'm depicting uh, a homozygous deletion just by chance, uh, a, mo a homozygous deletion that just by chance uh, affected one of the enzymes, and due to this, this, the cancer cells don't have the metabolic enzyme anymore. So uh, these are interesting because normally, under normal circumstances, uh, both cells do fine in terms of normal cells still can catalyze the reaction and cancer cells as well because there's still an intact copy of the enzyme. But an interesting thing happens because uh, we can perturb these cells, and then uh, a perturbation of interest to us is the, is the one where we introduce targets and selective drugs to the environment. And then here, I'm showing you a hypothetical drug represented by this orange hexagon. And then what this drug does is it basically inhibits enzyme one, but not enzyme two, meaning that if you give this drug to the cell, it will, it will inhibit enzyme one, but leave the enzyme two, uh, do, and then it will do, it will do its job. And then these type of drugs are, of course, available and are, are interesting because they create an opportunity for us to use them uh, in therapy for, for, for particular contexts. And the particular context, and that's what we call a vulnerability, uh, we, are, we are looking for these, these scenarios where, as I mentioned, and this is just uh, from, a, uh, from my previous slide, uh, I'm showing you normal cells and versus cancer cells, and now you can see that the cancer cells, due to homozygous deletion, lost one of these enzymes. And now if you put the, the drug in context, what you see is that uh, in normal cells, you're inhibiting one of the enzymes, but the normal cells still, do the second, still have the second enzyme, so they can catalyze the reaction. But in cancer cells, an interesting thing happens, and then you, since they lost one of the enzymes already due to deletion, and the other one is being inhibited by this drug, and of course, if this reaction is essential to the cell, what will happen is that when you introduce this drug to the patient, if you use this drug as a therapy option, this drug will select Selectively kill the cancer cells, and since it's not doing catastrophic effects on the, it is not causing any catastrophic effect on the normal cells. It means that these type of drugs will have really reduced toxicity, so are ideal therapy options. All right, so this is the vulnerability that we are talking about, and as I will mention, uh, we are looking for these type of vulnerabilities in a systematic manner. Um, our, our, our project basically uh, sits in the middle of this pipeline, so this is a computational pipeline that I'm showing. And as you can see, our method uh, stands on the shoulder of really giant databases. Um, uh, specifically, we are taking genomic profiles from cancer samples, 
uh, and uh, detailed information about metabolic pathways and also uh, associations of target drug inform uh, drug targets informations and now using them as input to our methods and as an output we are creating a list of metabolic vulnerabilities that are tailored for each patient so these are individualized metabolic vulnerabilities associated with drugs and furthermore we are also taking CCLE meaning the cell lines into account and now we are trying to match each vulnerability with a cell line so that if you're interested in validating the cell line you, uh, in, uh, this, this vulnerability, you will have the chance to get the cell line and then do an in vitro testing. So this is what we do, uh, and um, this is what I'm going to talk about. Uh, and uh, I won't be going into the details too much because processing and uh, th that goes a lot with the processing and integrating the databases, but the type of resources that we are using are as follows. So uh, first of all, we are, as I mentioned, we are using uh, pathway information for metabolic, metabolic reactions that are happening inside cells. And for this, we are using this integrated, integrated database called Pathway Commons 2, also maintained by our group. Uh, we are also including keg enzymes just to increase our coverage uh, and then to, to, to be able to capture more metabolic reactions. Uh, we are getting all the genomic data, all the cancer genomic data from CBIO portal. We are using CBIO portal's web API. So whatever, in, whatever it is in CBIO portal, we are t including it as an input. And as you, can, as you can imagine, most of these studies are TCGA. Uh, we also have CCLE, just to match the, the vulnerabilities with the cell lines. And we also have these other, uh, other cancer studies from, from uh, memory stone catching and from other resources. And for the drugs, uh, by the time we started doing this project, there was no resource that was basically combining all of these drug targets information, meaning that which drug targets, which protein or which gene. Uh, so we had to come up with a tool, uh, and then this is what we call the PyHelper tool, which aggregates data from multiple resources and gives you a list of, list of drug target relationships. So we, we established this pipeline. We, we, we came up with ways to integrate all of these data and then ran this analysis on 16 cancer studies. Uh, one of them is CCLE, as you can see here, and it has the most number of, it has the highest number of hits in it because it is a huge, it's a huge cancer study with 1,000 samples in it, and also the data type, of course, is, is different than the normal, uh, the, the cancer types. But, but one thing to appreciate from, from, from this picture is that, uh, as I mentioned, there are 15 cancer studies and also the CCLE, uh, the, the number of hits that we find in each cancer study varies based on the number of samples included in that cancer study or, or the type of tumor that the timer, the, the type of tumor that we are working with because some of the cancer types are driven by copy number alterations. Uh, but these numbers vary, uh, but what you can appreciate that mo for most of them, you, we, we were able to identify vulnerabilities on the order of hundreds. So it is interesting, but looking at this graph is not that interesting, of course. So now I'm going to give you the summary uh, and then give you a sense of what kind of vulnerabilities and how, 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 uh, how, how we are doing in terms of the coverage. So on the left, uh, you have this, the, this, this figure, uh, th th this, this cartoon. Here you have 100 figures. Um, if it's a Petri dish, then it means that we are, we are including the cell line. So this is all the, all the samples that we are screening uh, in our analysis. Uh, otherwise, it's a, it's a, cancer, it's a, cancer, a tumor sample. Um, so if it is red, it means that we were able to identify a, a, at least a single vulnerability in those set of samples. So uh, one thing I didn't mention that in these 16 cancer studies, we have 6,000 samples, 1,000 cell lines and 5,000 uh, tumor samples. So that uh, each figure represents almost 60 samples in this picture. So if it's red, it means that we were able to identify a vulnerability for that set of, for that set of uh, samples. Uh, as you can see, for the cell lines, almost half of them, we were able to identify a vulnerability. And when you look at the cancer samples, uh, you, you, see, you will see that almost 20% of the samples has at least one vulnerability, which is really interesting. Um, and of course, these are two different data sets, so uh, finding a vulnerability in a cell line won't matter that much. Uh, but but when, you look at, when you look at all the homozygous deletions that, that, lead to a, the, that lead to a metabolic vulnerability, then an interesting thing happens because now you see that 
out of 260 homozygous deletions that cause a vulnerability, uh, a majority of them, that is 150 of them, are shared between tumors and cell lines, meaning that if you were able to find a vulnerability in a cancer sample, it's really likely that you will also find a matching cell line that you can do an in vitro testing for that particular drug. Um, so now I'm going to show you another overview of the, of the data that we have. And now, instead of showing you samples, now I'm showing you sets of vulnerabilities that we, were, we identified in this study. So overall, we were able to identify almost 4,000 vulnerabilities uh, across cancer cell lines and also uh, uh, cancer samples. And here, uh, each drug figure, we have 100 of them. Each drug figure represents almost 40 therapeutic vulnerabilities that we identify in this analysis. Uh, and then uh, with the color of the drug, I'm showing you what kind of a drug that you can use to target those vulnerabilities. So if a drug is orange, it means that it was FDA approved for cancer therapy. And as you can appreciate, almost 9% of the vulnerabilities that we identified in this study can be targeted by a, cancer, by a drug that's already being used in cancer therapy. And if the drug is green, um, it means that if it, it, is FDA, it, if it, it is FDA approved, but for a different disease. Um, but also, you, you should appreciate that almost 40% of these vulnerabilities can be targeted by an FDA approved drug. Although it's not, it's, they're not ideal as, uh, as cancer drugs, there's still something that means that they, they have some safety data uh, associated with them. And the rest, uh, uh, the rest colored by gray, means that there are experimental drugs that there are no uh, FDA approval uh, ha happened for these drugs. Um, so, uh, we created this list, but of course, it's, it's really hard to, hard to show what a vulnerability is, so it has multidimensional data to it. So we had to come up with a, with a website, supplemental website, that you can use to get overall statistics, see what a vulnerability is. So this is our website. Uh, you can get all the vulnerabilities by the frequency, how, how frequent they are. Uh, you, can, you can see what kind of genes involved in that, uh, in that vulnerability or the metabolic context of it. Uh, you don't have to put down this URL. You can uh, simply search for, the, for the, uh, our title, and then you will land on this page. Um, but you can use, to, as I mentioned, you can use this website to get a sense of what is the overall statistics. You can also uh, drill down to a cancer study. For example, here I'm showing four sample vulnerabilities from ovarian cancer. And uh, here we have four patients with four different vulnerabilities, and we are showing uh, extra information for each of these vulnerabilities. And if you like, if you're interested in, you can always uh, get more information about a vulnerability, meaning that you can see the pathway context of it, or what kind of drugs that you can use to target that vulnerability. Uh, furthermore, we, we, we had to come up with a, with a confidence score for each vulnerability, meaning that how confident we are saying that this, this vulnerability is real in that patient. Uh, of course, I don't have the time to go over all of these details, but it's basically a score that you can use to, use to prioritize the type of vulnerabilities that you want to validate. Um, so we put all of these information as a website, as I mentioned, um, and then this is published as a computational resource, so we are actively looking for collaborators. But the, but the reason that we did this, this analysis is that because there's this phenomenon right now, uh, and th that has something to do with the basket trials, of course, uh, we can imagine a cancer patient walking into a clinic where, where, where we get the genomic profiling uh, uh, data and then fe feed it into one of these computational methods that I, something like I just described, and then get a, get a patient tailored, that's me meaning that individualized list of me metabolic vulnerabilities or any type of vulnerabilities for that patient. And in the meantime, if, if, it's, if it's possible, you can also establish xenografts or primary cultures from the same tumor material. And now using this list, you can try to in vitro or in vivo test these vulnerabilities. And if you are lucky enough, and if you can show that some of these vulnerabilities are indeed vulnerabilities, you can now go back to the cohort of patients, and in a basket trial manner, you can collect all of these, uh, these samples that have the same vulnerability and hopefully establish a clinical trial for them. Um, so, finally, uh, again, I would like to thank you for listening to this project. Uh, we recently published this, this, the, our results as a computational resource. As I mentioned, we are actively looking for collaborators that we can collaborate to systematically uh, to t t test these vulnerabilities. Uh, we have this supplemental website that you can exp use to explore the vulnerabilities. And our poster number is two, uh, although it's an even number, I'll be around, so feel free to come by and then ask any questions if you have. Thanks. We have time for a question. 
and of course, I was rushing to it, so I, I forgot to thank Chris, uh, who mentored during, who mentored me during this process, and also Nikki Schulz for for his really incredible help uh, with the study design. So, I, I had a question. I, that was really fascinating. Um, when you showed the number of uh, vulnerabilities, uh, you know, it looked correlated with the number of samples a little bit. Can you give just a sense on, you know, how you know what? what cancers have the most uh, as far as the rate of metabolic vulnerabilities? Right, th th that's a great question. And I think, yes, uh, the number of vulnerabilities that we find correlate with the number of samples. But there are also different things, because these type of vulnerabilities happen just by chance. So you expect them to be correlated with the number of samples that you have. The more samples you have, the more vulnerabilities you can identify, because these are happening by chance. But another thing is that some of the, for example, cancer types here, for example, ovarian cancer and also uh, breast cancer, they, these cancers have subtypes that are driven by copy number alteration. So if you have such a tumor su subtype, then you, 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 you're more, you are more likely to find a vulnerability rather than a mutational, mutational driven uh, cancer type. Yep. So in your pathway database, do you, some of these metabolic pathways are quite intertwined and there's backup pathways if you interfere with one or the other and I assume you haven't gotten to that level of complexity. This is just whether there's two enzymes doing one biochemical step and one and you've lost redundancy there? Exactly true, yeah. Uh, so we are relying on pathway commons, which is curated, manually curated. So we are, we are basically relying on people's idea of what a metabolic reaction is. And for each metabolic reaction, it's, it's really easy to grab all of these enzymes that catalyze the same reaction. But of course, there are inconsistencies where you can find two enzymes, although they are labeled as doing the same thing, they can do different things. Or sometimes you have these pathway level uh, alternative pathways that we are not currently considering in, in our analysis. But yes, that's true. Great. Thanks a lot. Thanks. OK. Next up is Hui Ding from USC. Uh, he's going to be talking about recurrent epistasis defines tumor methylome differences.